went that idea of starting the stream later than usual. The countdown lasts longer than the video does. I forgot about that. Anyway, we'll we'll chill out. We'll just take it easy. We'll just chill out and take it easy. So there we go. No stresses and no worries. Um, all is good. All is good. So what have you guys been up to this week? What have you been up to this week? Uh, let's chat a little bit about that. I have had an amazing... I'm just trying to think. I have had an amazing two weeks of gaming. Sorry, lime scale. I hate lime scale. Such a British thing. It's weird. Anyway, I've had an amazing two weeks of um, gaming over the past two weeks. Anyway, uh, it's been it's been absolutely fantastic. I've played with a whole bunch of different groups, and uh, I'm, I've been really enjoying it. I've been really, really, really enjoying it. So, uh, honorable five nine six says, "When is your Star Wars game, or have I missed it?" Well. Um, applications for that Star Wars game well, was quite a while ago and was closed quite a while ago now, almost five weeks ago. Um, so we are recording them. We are, we've had our first session, which was a lot of fun. And um, that has now... Um, well, we've got our next session coming up this Friday, I should say. And one of the players has done some amazing artwork, absolutely amazing artwork. So hopefully I'll get permission to share that on, on, on the video. So um, I'm actually at a bit of a quandary at the moment in terms of these, because we are recording them, we are recording them, so we can share them later on. Um, but I'm also recording another sci-fi show, not Star Wars. This is we're using my custom tri-fi system. And um, that was a bit of a slow start, but I've now got four episodes in the bag. And that's also quite fun. And what's, 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 what I find particularly interesting is that they're both science fiction games. One is Star Wars and, and the other one is not, obviously. obviously. But um, it's interesting to see how the different plots are unfolding. Um, one is a political plot where I think literally the, the players were going... Do we want to be involved in this, or is this too high level for us? Is this too, too politically dangerous? So that's been an interesting one. I really have enjoyed that. So uh, that's the one, and the other one have just been good old fashioned fun, and it has. I think it's been fun anyway. So I am looking forward to this Friday. Um, it, um, yeah. Well, we'll see about that. And uh, anyway, we'll release them when we can. Um, I kind of wanted to have them all in the bag first before I started releasing them because otherwise you kind of you get a pressure to release every second week and if you actually haven't recorded because everyone's been on, on you know they've taken a break or something like that then then there's a gap and it becomes a bit of a, a, a bit of a challenge so um, yes anyway I've been rearranging the room that I'm I'm renting at the moment whilst I'm in between houses as it were and one of the things that I came across was my dice bag and this is this is about half of the dice in my dice bag. And I wanted to ask you a quick question because it's it's full. It is full of dice. How many dice do you think are in here? And I want you to answer in terms of years. How many dice do you think are in here in terms of years? Anyway, just an interesting one there. Okay, uh, let's see. Where are we? We are. Where are we? Where are we? Uh, if you are going to ask a question about any TRPG that you are currently playing, please put the word uh, question in front and I will then answer it. Uh, so Xander the Green says, how can I make a Thieves Guild game more interesting? My new campaign, the PCs are a part of a guild and I want to make the missions unique and not repetitive. As with almost any organization, I would always default back to the four, right? The four different types of ventures, thwarting, discovering, collect, uh, collecting and delivering. And if you look at that from a thieves perspective, thieves thwarting, what could thieves prevent from happening? What could thieves prevent from happening? What could they thwart? They could thwart a rival thieves guild. They could go and thwart a lord trying to attack something. They could thwart a rogue thief who has broken away. 
There are lots of thwarting missions that thieves could be sent on. Collecting. Well, that's an obvious one. Break into the castle and collect something. So you don't want to do that too often because, as you said, it becomes repetitive. But sometimes it could be a living thing. Go and collect this box and there's something alive inside of it. Go and collect this animal and the animal provides a major problem. When it comes to delivering, well, that's a reverse, which is quite fun. Go and break into something. That's always fun. Go and break into the building and place this here. We're setting evidence. Welcome all of the forgers. Welcome World Anvil. Welcome, welcome, welcome World Anvilites. Uh, we're actually going to be showcasing some World Anvil stuff later on in today's show. So, um, so that's how I would look at it. And then discovering, it could also be, we need to know what the Lord is planning on doing. So break into the Lord's castle and steal his plans. That certainly can work very well. Uh, as well, and I, I would, I would do that. I would, I would sit, sit around those four, look at those four, and then try and figure out what is the, the motivation, what is the goal behind the the thieves guild? What are they trying to asset? What are they trying to get to? And I think that's also important. The thieves guild, they want power, they want influence, they want money. Do they want to protect themselves from an external threat? Are they under threat? So I would then turn to look at it and say, okay, well, where does the master of the Thieves Guild want to go? Look at the politics within the Thieves Guild. And this actually goes for any guild for that matter. Who's in charge? Who wants to be in charge? Who should have been in charge? Who was in charge and wants to get back into it? So there's lots and lots and lots of ways that you can add to your adventures um to 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 look at them from different perspectives and if you work through one of each of those that's eight or nine adventures already and so there you go there you go that's that's what i would do with that white tiger 225 says game has been put on pause because one player wants a break but he also doesn't want to do fifth edition anymore while my other players do want to do fifth edition should i continue the game without them for the sake of the other players it's a common, common, common problem. And as uh, I discovered, I like to explore different systems. My players didn't. They liked 5th edition. They liked playing 3.5. Uh, so if it's one player who doesn't want to change and they want to take a break, let them take a break and let the rest of your group carry on and try and find another player. Try and find another player. Uh, bring in some fresh blood. It's amazing what a bit of a new perspective at the gaming table brings. Sometimes it can bring new life to the group. Uh, sometimes it can be too disruptive. But that's part and parcel of role-playing, I believe, is the social contract that we all form when we start to play. And I look at my Star Wars game, for example, where effectively it was pooling together five people who had never played together before... And they had to work out their social contract as they were going along and work out also the courtesies that one has to, to afford to your fellow players when you're playing online rather than around the table. So it's I think it's part and parcel. So yes, if you have one player who doesn't want to play or wants a break, let them take a break, you carry on. Don't stop just for one player. Um, I am of the firm belief that one player does not cause the game to stop running unless you only have a one player player game in which case you can find another one so anyway there we are uh, if you're wondering what people are talking about in terms of six uh have done me for 40 years uh 30 years we are asking the question these are some of my dice that i happen to have with me um they were so important that they went with me from south africa to japan and then from japan to the uk how many years worth of dice do you think are in this jar how many years worth of dice and this is a mixture there are dice from monopoly sets there are dice that have weird numbers there are skull dice there are giant dice there are small miniature dice uh how many years do you think is in this jar so there we go uh, daniel lands says i need advice on a fifth edition DD pc my first ever which I want to be a paladin who swore the oath of the ancients, but I also want him to have a wild, uncontrolled side. Any suggestions? Berserk, multi-classing with a barbarian, or race like Canthrope, or other shapeshifter. Daniel, if it's your first character, I would have the wild side being part of the personality of the paladin. 
So often when we're creating characters, we just look at the stats and we look at the, the races and the builds that we forget all about the personality, which is not in the rulebook. As far as I know, 5th edition has never released anything which has given you any kind of direction on the personality of that paladin, or of any character for that matter. So if your paladin has a wild side, why not have it that your paladin has a short temper? And that your paladin, when confronted and when their triggers are punched, the paladin flies into an uncontrollable rage. It doesn't have to be lycanthropy or barbarianism. It really doesn't have to be any of that. It could literally be he just loses control, sees red and goes mad and just starts attacking stuff. And then later on is remorseful and repentant. And that's why he became a paladin in the first place, was he was hoping his god would give him direction and the ability to control this rage that is within him. I think that's a far more interesting character than going, well, I'm playing a barbarian paladin. Okay, but what is the paladin like? What is the barbarian like? It's the same thing, but you've now multiclassed. I've never been a fan of multiclassing personally. I think you don't get the best of both worlds. I think you fall between both worlds, as a matter of fact. So that would be my suggestion. You don't need an excuse. Simply tell the other players, my character has this... He's, he has a rage in him, and these are his triggers. You have played with, or you have journeyed with this character before, and you know that if people call him a coward, he gets very angry. That's all it is. It doesn't need to be a mechanical excuse. It could be a personality excuse. And that afterwards your character is repentant. Anyway, so there we are. Right, that's my opinion on that. The Dungeon Tomb says, Hello, I need your expertise. Well, I can give you my advice. Um, uh, love to see this in a video. How to add hit dice to a monster? I ask because so far I can't figure out why there is such a big difference in hit points on many monsters of the same CR. In the damage, it shows in chapter 9 that the CR3 have between 110 and 110. Okay, so what you are asking me is why are the imaginary numbers for some imaginary creatures bigger than the imaginary numbers for other imaginary creatures? You're looking for a mathematical solution. I'm afraid I certainly, certainly cannot give you one. I cannot give you a rules reason either. All that I can give you is this piece of advice. Why not just add more hit points to those creatures if you feel they need to be tougher? There's no rule saying that you have to use the monsters as written. At no point do any of the rule books in Dungeons and Dragons ever say you may not, as the dungeon master, change these values. As a matter of fact, there's a paragraph which says you can change anything in this book as long as it's to your liking and you let the players know. So simply let the players know, listen guys, I'm using the monsters manual as a reference but the monsters are all my own. And then you can make the hit points whatever you like. So if you want them to be higher, then that's absolutely fine. And if you want them to be lower, then go for it. What are the monsters representing as far as the player characters are concerned? They're representing monsters that they have to overcome. Mathematically, they are representing a imaginary number that your players' imaginary numbers have to overcome using the same mathematical formula in theory. But Unless you are at a convention where that is, or with your, your table where you are like where you like that kind of simulation, then it really doesn't matter. You can change those hit points as you like. So there we go. There we go. Uh, that's my opinion on that, on that one. But I'm sure there's plenty of people in chat who might be able to help you with your conundrum in terms of why there is a discrepancy. Um, Johnny Nord, Nordby says, new group, uh, new group, new as a GM. Okay, fantastic. From my players' backgrounds, I am actually able to connect all four with their backstories, but would that be too much? Should I instead keep it separate? No, bring them together. Let them come together. Let them let, bring those backstories together. But as long as it doesn't feel contrived, as long as it doesn't feel like, well, um, <sighs> his mother's father's milkmaid knew your father's aunt's uncle's stamp collecting associate and that's how you know each other uh, you know so I, I i wouldn't make it contrived let it feel as if it does make logical sense but sure tie it in why not if they've created backstories that sit within your campaign that's brilliant it means that you have briefed them sufficiently on their world and inspired them in a similar kind of direction which means that you've given them a very clear direction to go in so i think that works very very well so i would do that 
Um, bu -bu -bu -bum. Honorable 596 has a question. Please, if you are asking questions, put the word question in the front. As you can see, they scroll past quite quickly. And if, I, if there isn't the word question, it's difficult for me to, to spot those. So Honorable 596's question says, This is a bit out of your wheelhouse, but can you help me come up with some supervillains for my plans on a superhero campaign that I'm preparing to run? I've got enough heroes, but I need more villains. Okay. Um, Supervillains are always fun from any kind of space. Um, in terms of your supervillains, there are some options for you to look at. Uh, well, no, let me rephrase. What are your supervillains trying to achieve? That is what I always look at. So is it safety? Of Is it world domination? Is it all the money in the world? I go back to looking at those and saying, okay, so what is it they really want and why do they want it? So if you look at someone like, say, um, I was going to use a bad example. Well, they turned it into a bad example. Um, let's say you are going to create a villain who who wants to be in charge of the entire world because they believe that they can run the world better than anybody else and they believe that they should be the dictator of that world. Okay, great. So that's what they want. They want power, basically. So you could then start to look at it and say, okay, well, what gives you the power to control people to get you into the position of being in charge of the world? You could have a superpower like Magneto and you can control the metal. That's a bit prosaic. So maybe you want to have the power to control minds or to influence people or to read minds. So I, I look at what is the motivation behind the supervillain first and then go from there. Or and another no technique that I have heard of, I haven't ever used it myself, but I have heard of it, is to look on your desk and choose stuff. So currently I have a COVID mask. So perhaps the supervillain has, wears a mask and can spread disease. So they're a plague bearer or they're known as the um, um, pestilence, whatever, right? So there's that. I have a awful bottle of diet ginger ale. So maybe it is someone who can cause your body to wither away and dissolve um or you can get get drunk so they're the drunken master i mean you, you can you can you can do whatever you like um but yes those are those are definitely some some options uh Kanori says when you are trying to learn a new system what do you do beyond reading it experimenting with running it and creating a cheat sheet cheat sheet suppose actual play recordings aren't available it's a very good question and I've got two systems one of which I have to do a review on at the end of this month and looking at the rule book you go well this gives me an idea of what's going on but what I usually try to do when I'm learning a new system is I step back and I say okay so they've got all of these little rules I don't care about those I don't care about the little rules what are they trying to do in the overall mechanic what is the bigger picture? I will never forget. I attended a convention in 2012, I think, or 2011. And it was to... I, I signed up to run a game, but I didn't read what I was signing up to run. I just read that I was going to be running a game. And about 10 minutes before the game started, I realized it was for Warhammer 40k. And I had never played 40k before. I didn't even know what the system was. And I went to one of the GMs who was very influential um, in in my um, evolution as a GM. And I said to him, I don't know how to play this. What I can't do this. What should I do? And he said, it's a percentile system. You roll under the percentile and that's it. That's all you need to know. Go. Go run the game, my son. And... He was absolutely right. Absolutely right. I said, okay, it's percentile system. Right. Give me one of the character sheets. Let me look at the skills or the whatevers that are available. Okay. Combat. I don't know how that works, but this is how I'm going to say it. You shoot to hit, you dodge to miss it or avoid it. And there we go. The players had an absolute amount of fun. And as we were going, some of the players had played before and they're like, well, actually, this is how it works. Mm, 
mm, okay that makes sense let's let's now start doing that way so i i definitely would do that i would definitely do that to you uh suggest that to you as a way of learning the game as well um boom boom how are we doing for time okay we're okay we are okay we are okay Menel Meneldil says, how do you subvert a trope without breaking suspension of disbelief? For instance, I want to make an adventure with cute halflings who are actually evils. Yeah. Yeah. So, look, I mean, the moment you make cute halflings who are actually evil, there's another trope, Right. Because cute halflings that are actually evil are basically what? The evil leprechauns from the movie Leprechaun. Um, so there's, I mean, that's how these things work. But they work because we have a general impression in our minds of of what these things are. As a species, as humans, we have this idea, at least anyone who's watched Lord of the Rings, of what hobbits are like. Or halflings, sorry. The way to to do it i think is to be uh, is to to treat it how they would treat it so for example um this is an awful example but it's the only one that i can think of that really makes sense if you went back to nazi germany in 1940 and you walked into a nazi ball a, a fancy party that the nazis used to throw you might find some of the Nazis in there who genuinely didn't think what they were doing was right. But you would find a lot who thought it was absolutely normal and they were doing the right thing and that that was, that was what their mandate was. But at that party, they would be happy, sociable, laughing, telling jokes. Everyone would be absolutely, absolutely a ball to hang out with. And if you didn't know that they were Nazis you would just think that you were at a party until you mention something that triggered them or until the next morning when you wake up with a hangover and you stagger out of the, bar, the, the ballroom. Oh, and there happen to be those very same people who were absolutely wonderful and now they're executing women and children because they think they're a subspecies. So when you are looking at your, your halflings and you want to make them evil, play them as if they don't see themselves as evil. Play them as if they see what they do is absolutely normal. And that will make it even more shocking. So the party might arrive in the village and there's the happy hobbits, uh, halflings, and they're smoking pipes and they've got fish curing and there's some meat on the rack and it's all brilliant and wonderful. And the PCs talk to them and they're quite happy to talk to the PCs until it comes down to dinner time and the PCs get invited to dinner because, well, why not? And then a half-naked elf gets dragged in front of the party and the lead hobbit turns to the party and says, uh, Which part would you like? The leg's quite tender, I see. It's got a nice pair of buttocks on that one. I'd suggest going for some rump, perhaps. And then suddenly the party goes, what? And before the party knows it, the elf has been slaughtered and is now a roast on the spit and the halflings are having a marvellous time. Would you like some more beer with your rump? You, uh, uh, the trope's gone because the party will be so blindsided that they wouldn't know what on earth had hit them, hopefully. Um, and, and so suddenly they now realise these halflings are completely and utterly nuts and and really need to be put down um so so that's what i would do uh, you know something 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 along those lines um yeah that's what i would do possibly tom hartnett has a question and i have an answer for your question <laughs> um What's a good way to run a battle with the PCs at the epicenter? It's a good question, Tom, and I get it a lot. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the battle around the PCs, you can roll for it if you really want to. If you really, really, really want to um, kind of have some battle thing going on, roll a dice um, for the one side, roll a d6 for the one side, roll a d6 for the other side, and see who got the higher number and then reduce the party by that. Um, I used to do that 
it's very random. Now, usually I tie the outcome to the party's journey itself. So if the party are doing really well, then the battle on the outside is going really well for, for their side. If the party is doing badly, then the battle is going badly for the party, the, the rest of the army on their side. I do that because then it makes the party's battle seem so much more important rather than just being a little battle in the throng of thousands. Because if you think about it, if you watch epic battle sequences like uh, in Lord of the Rings, in The Return of the King, where you've got Legolas and, 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 and company running around causing all kinds of mayhem, there's titanic battles happening elsewhere. But they're not the heroes of the story, so we don't really get to see them. And just because Gandalf and Legolas and, and company are doing really well, it kind of feels like the rest of the world is doing really well as well. And when they're doing badly, the rest seem to be doing badly. So, yeah, I, I try and focus it around those kinds of, of individuals. Before we go too much further, I want to just talk about um, a submission that we got from Thanos. I think he's in the chat. Um it was a submission originally to the Circle of World Builders uh, masterclass where it was a template, which we uh, went through, as a matter of fact, on this, this live show. And he got a hold of me later on and said, well, look, he took the advice that we had dispensed during the live show and then had converted it into a World Anvil template and had had written it up and 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 would i look at it again so i said well i'll bring it up on the show because i think it's a very good example of how you can take the journey of the five steps that i do and convert that into an adventure and into something that is visually very 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 good so i'm going to share that with you i'll share the link if permission is given by Thanos. So here's the desktop. Um, oh, I've got a bit of an effect happening on the desktop. Give me just a second here. Um, I'm just going to turn that off so you get it in full resolution. I think it looks very, very, very pretty. I like the kind of the dice that have been used. There's a bit of a map going on here in the background. And then it's it's this whole whole adventure, as you can see. I mean, it's two beautifully let out sentences and uh, yeah all right so we're going to show the spoiler these are the steps as you have seen them now i believe he's actually made this as a template so if you are a world anvil user uh there must be a way that you can share this template and use this template so there we go there's all of our random npc names we've got player rewards in there we've got treasure which it looks like it's actually linked it looks like it's actually linked. So if I click on it, I haven't explored it. I really haven't explored it. Okay, so we are in the process of creating. Oh, multipass, it has not been made public. Uh, that's an important thing to bear in mind when you are using World Anvil, is that you can make some things public and some things not. So there is the the write out, and, and I, we're not going to go through whether the, the story has changed or not. But if you remember, it was Umbra Mortis, the, the, the shadow who steals souls and things. I see there's a link there, which could take us to the monster. Is it? Sh yeah, there we go. So there are all of his stats. Now, because it is on World Anvil, we've got all of these very interesting things. And it's, it's interesting how it's been hidden. So there's our strength. So if we make a strength check, you see there World Anvil actually throws up the number. So that's quite nice. Um, and uh, it does take a little bit of, of programming to get there. But uh, I see there is the link being shared. So I will share that for everyone on YouTube if you want to go and have a look at it. I think it's really, really, really well done. Some nice imagery attached with it. So this is this is the power, I think, of taking this this journey and then and then expressing it beyond and further and, and being able to link stuff so that you've got it all there. I think it's a really, really, really nice um uh, way of of doing it and and then and that's the whole power of 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 world anvil and then this links obviously back to the main homepage, um where there is this beautiful rendering i stand to be corrected but this looks it looks like this could be a flowscape world i don't know it looks to me like flowscape 
which is the program that I use for generating 3D backgrounds. And that has been done. What a lovely way of showing your players this is the valley that you've come to. What are the promises that are in that space? So uh, I think, yeah, it's it's a really, uh, I've zoomed out now, so it's looking very weird. But what a wonderful, wonderful way of presenting your world um, and keeping updates and things. So go ahead. There's the Discord community you can join. Um, gods or it's all here it's all here it's wonderful absolutely absolutely wonderful let's give it a follow so there we are all right so i think that is a fantastic thing thanos i think yes confirming flowscape being used there for the world um it's not a free piece of software but um it certainly is i think it's like ten dollars or fifteen dollars or something uh, if you want to make these kinds of imagery it's pretty good at making some pretty diverse ones so I just want to say thank you to Thanos for sharing this this world and and for for showing us how it can be done if you want to make it look as good as humanly possible. So I really do really do appreciate that. Thank you um, for that. Okay, and I will be reviewing new uh, submissions at the end of today's show. All right, uh, I think that's really awesome. Now, um, where was I? What was I doing? Uh, what's my name? Um, ba -ba 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 -bum. Uh, blah, 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 gone blank. Gone completely blank. I was looking at all the questions. That's right. Questions. 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 Uh, White Tiger 225. Got to get going. Much love. Thanks. 225. White Tiger. We'll see you later. Um, Drake Avale says, not exactly a question, but can you tease them with our character portraits? Inky did such an amazing job. Inky did do an amazing job. And Draco, I will if Inky gives permission. But until she gives permission, then um, I'm afraid I can't share it on the live stream. But I, I, I'm sure she would say yes. But I don't want to assume because that would be dangerous. I see the, the actual adventure uh, Thanos is sharing as well. So I'll just repeat that for the folks in um, YouTube. Okay, so 596 Honorable says, my current plan to start the superhero story is having a big, a general big bag type ramp, ramping up operations to retire. She's pregnant, right as the pieces get involved. Do you have any plans to make that flow more naturally? Well, I think what you're doing there is absolutely awesome. She's planning to retire because she's pregnant. The PCs find out that she's retiring because she's pregnant. Well, of course. Yes, they fight their way. They get to her. She's like, I'm pregnant. Just leave me alone. Of course, who or what is she pregnant with? Of course, she's pregnant with the DNA impregnated child of one of the superheroes. And that is the demon monster god thing that gets given birth to at the end of your first campaign leading into your second campaign. I think that would be absolutely awesome. Of course, all of the other supervillains who are now trying to seize control of the power vacuum that she has left behind are also trying to kill her. So the players are going to have to protect her because they can't have her child, which is also the biological child of one of the players, be murdered because technically she hasn't done anything wrong. Now, yes, she invaded several countries and caused several governments to collapse, but that was then. Now she's pregnant with the child of one of the player characters who's innocent, so they can't just let her die, can they? No, they can't. No. What a wonderful twist. There we go. You don't need me. You're super evil already. Uh, Yosu Ramirez says, I gave my players a god-slaying dagger. I love god-slaying daggers. The current plot is to kill an ice god. Awesome. The player that kills the god becomes the god, but exhibits power slowly. How do I make this process better? If they become an ice god, does that prevent them from, from adventuring further? Does that prevent them from adventuring further? Are they then bound to the ice that they are the god of and they can no longer carry on playing? Because in that case, then, I would not have it that the PC gets stuck that way. That's not very fun for the PC. Yay, you slew a god. Now you're trapped here until someone comes and kills you. I, 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 I find that difficult. So I would suggest looking at that first then i would suggest that the journey is pretty pretty linear do they know that it's a god slaying dagger do they know that um or is it just supposed to be a god slaying dagger is it the dagger itself or does the dagger need to be mounted into the god slaying staff making the god slaying spear so they have to go and find the staff first before this dagger will work 
um, look at those kinds of things, uh, the slaying of the actual ice god. What are the ramifications to that? Do the glaciers melt whilst the ice god is dying and flood villages and cities? And is there that kind of risk? Is that law that the players need to find by going to the ancient library that contains texts on the last time an ice god was slain? Are there other ice gods that would want to prevent that from happening? Lots and lots of questions just immediately come up when thinking about that kind of adventure. Uh, I hope that will jog something for you. Okay. This is not too bad when flat, actually. It's not too bad when it's flat and it's green so that's why it's transparent obviously well it's transparent plastic because it's transparent plastic anyway um honorable five nine six my current plan okay we've already spoken about the pregnant woman uh nicholas morrow says uh, compliment you're doing an awesome job happy father's day because you are my gm father <laughs> well there we go nicholas morrow um i've never closest i've ever been as a father is the two dogs that i had and i'm fairly certain yeah no i'm I'm fairly certain they they are much happier where they are i saw a photograph of them the other day they are both the same as me just fat they obviously having fun where they are which is great to hear um but yes there we go thank you very much i really do appreciate the uh the compliment nothing wrong with that uh <laughs> D.W. Rowlands, I literally just upgraded to World Anvil Grandmaster to use this template. Thank you, Thanos. Uh, Thanos, I think you should write to Demetrius and Janet and tell them, hey, listen, I need the, this or that, so please um, please give me 10% of that sale. Um, another question. Oh, no, no, same question. The, d the Dungeon Tomb says, okay, here is a GM question. In earlier D&D editions kenkus would love would would uh, kenkus have low light vision but in fifth edition they don't mention what vision they have but there is no light vision in fifth edition that's right so what vision would you call the kenkus vision in fifth edition and in all your videos lately you have this template with description my question is what front font is the heading font the one where you have the first letter in the square Okay, well, Dungeon Tomb, the font of the first letter in the square, I don't know what it's called. I have thousands of fonts. Um, I would have to open up the file and 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 go and have a look, which is it's a bit of a process. Uh, I can recommend, though, that you go to a thousand and one fonts.com and there you will find a whole bunch of fonts. Bear in mind, some of them are not copyright free, and if you're using them for commercial purposes, um, you're supposed to donate or, or do something along those lines. But there you go. Um, so back to your previous question. Why do Kenkus no longer have low light or vision or dark vision or some kind of vision? The way that races or bioforms, as they now seem to be called, the way that the different races within D&D are structured, especially for 5th edition, is they are built on a race template. Now, that race template is actually in, I believe, the 5th edition player's handbook, or it might be in the DMG, where it shows you and says, the race may only have this, this, or that. Um, I know they can have skills, they can have an armor uh, or damage reduction, they can have a breath weapon, they can have a this, they, can, they can't have all of it. So the Kenku might literally have just run out of all the stuff that they needed to have in order to, to, to get to, to dark vision or low light vision. Um, so that is something that you could look at. It could also be an opportunity for... for um, the, the, it could also be that they decided that anyone who had low light vision simply drops that altogether. I don't know. Do half elves have dark vision? I, I, I don't play half elves. I haven't played a half elf in a long time. So there you are. Um, da -ba Skidaddle Skadoodle says, How do you create a good and believable political reason for a war to explode? Mine seem too superficial and bland. Okay, so how do you create a good and believable political reason for a war to explode? To give you the trite answer, there is never a good reason for war to explode. If you look at the origins of the European wars, some have started because uh, 
One leader stole another leader's wife. Some have started because a treaty was signed that said if another country was invaded, you would counter-invade. I don't know if those are good reasons. Another one started because there was a difference in opinion of the religious uh, choices of the uh, same country or of different countries. Um, so the the biggest thing I can say, though, is that very often wars are not started because of a single reason. There are lots of little reasons first, and those usually come together under the guise of a big reason. So that is definitely, definitely something to look at. When, when Germany invaded Poland, going back to World War II, the rest of Europe went, oh, it's so bad. You really shouldn't do that. You really, 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 really shouldn't do that. But then when Germany started moving south and attacking what is now the Czech and Slovak republics, they still shouldn't do that. And then it was when they hit Belgium and Holland, where the treaties forced England to get involved in the war. Uh, that's when the whole thing just erupted and it changed from being a sort of a Germanic thing to suddenly being a global uh, event. And the, the Americans weren't involved either. Um, they didn't want to be involved. They were sitting on the fence. Uh, and rightly so. It was a European war at the, at the start. Um, so, so yeah, war is, is a very complex thing. But I would have a lot of little elements first. A land issue, a rights issue, a marriage that was denied, um, an assassination attempt gone wrong, and then a big catalyst. And, of course, the PC should be right at the centre of that catalyst. GM Brightside says... I'm considering creating an entirely homebrew game system. Since you've done it before, do you think it's worth the effort? Or would adapting an existing system be smarter? I would say, on the whole, it is worth it. If you are a game master in general. Why do I say this? Because I have, in... 30 years of role-playing almost, I have created many systems. I have tried to create many role-playing systems, standalone systems. Um, and sure, none of them are as big as d d None of them got published. But as a game master, I was so much more empowered. And I think perhaps that's why this channel, to a large degree, is so anti-rules is because I have sat there and struggled with how do you balance this race? How do you balance this spell power? How do you do this? Or I have made the game system and then suddenly... Um, oh, I do see the audio is quite low. Sorry, let me just do... Let me get a little bit louder for you. Um, why is this so far away? There we go. There we go. Okay, so that should be... That should be a little bit better in terms of audio. That should be a little bit better in terms of audio. So, um, by having tried and failed and tried and succeeded sometimes, I can sit back and look at a rule system as it exists. So, whether it's Dungeons and Dragons or um, Torg or um, Maximum Apocalypse, whatever. I can sit and look at them and go, okay, this is, is what I... I think they're trying to do and because I understand a little bit how gaming works this is what I expect the rest of the rules to be like and so it makes it easier to 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 go on that flow but it also makes it easier for then for you to make up rules on the fly where it's like well there is no rule for riding an elephant whilst airborne and the elephant is doing somersaults the rule book doesn't have anything like that and there is nothing that comes close, you know, so so you can then make up a call that you are more confident in because you've tried to design this stuff yourself. I think, ask yourself this question. Why are you trying to make the role-playing game in the first place? So if I look at the try system and I look at the try fly system that I've been working on this year, why did I why did I write it? There are so many good role playing systems out there. Why would I why would I why would I write it? I wrote it because I don't yet see a role playing game that does what I ultimately want 
or what I ultimately enjoy about role playing, which is having control over your destiny while still not being in control. I know it sounds weird, but as the GM, you have complete control over the destiny within the game, but the players don't. And so I have always wanted a system where the players can't tell you the outcome. They can't tell you the story. They don't drive the narrative. That's the GM's job. But the chances of their character succeeding are not necessarily based only on dice, but are based on their choices as well. So that was my design intent with creating the Tri and the Tri-Fi system. And I think it's kind of getting there. We're using the Tri-Fi system for my sci-fi game. And so, so that's, it's kind of working. I'm looking at it and I'm going, my players are now seeing how the system works and they're going, I really need to succeed on this roll. So I'm going to roll the dice, but I'm going to, my character is going to put everything they have into succeeding. And then they actually succeed. I hate systems where it's like, oh, you can spend life and then you might still fail. I hate that. So anyway, all right. So, so, so uh, yeah, it's a big question and I, I, I like it. So Nicholas Morris says, can you give a few examples of how you would use, a, use dinosaurs in a D20 modern game for traps and environmental puzzles? Dinosaurs in a D20 modern game. Well, 10 points to you for using a D20 modern system anyway, my personal favorite of all time. Um, how you would use dinosaurs for traps and environmental puzzles? Well, one of the things that I would love to see, if assuming that they are living, living dinosaurs, um, I would like to see a sauropod being used as a bridge. So the characters have to run across a sauropod and get from one tip to the other. We now know how they used to walk, or at least we think we know how they used to walk. They definitely could act as a very nice bridge or crane. So I think that could be quite a nice one. I think also you could have territorial hunting zones of various predators, maybe some of the raptors, and they need to move between the territorial zones and not set off the, the the raptors if there's two packs they can walk between the two because neither of the of the two packs will come close enough to attack the players because they are worried about each other so you could look at something like that i could also see that they get the wrong eggs so they have some dinosaur eggs which they think belong to uh, some of the duck build dinosaurs the hadrosaurs but instead they actually belong to um, I don't know, Triceratops or something. And as a result, they're being stalked by this mother Triceratops, even though the Hadrosaurs, they're trying to give the eggs back and then the Hadrosaurs are attacking. I mean, you can you can go back. But yeah, I, those off the top of my head, those are the three that I would look at because um, I think those can be quite fun. Uh, okay. Connor Lennon says, how would you set up consequences for breaking social norms, honor rules in a feudal Japanese setting? Well, okay, so um, feudal Japan, honor was a very, very important thing, provided that you actually had any. So you have to remember in feudal Japan, very roughly, there were four levels of caste. There was the nobles, then there were the samurai, and then there were the, the farmers. Sorry, there were five classes, the farmers and then craftsmen. And then right at the bottom were businessmen right the, the 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 sellers the merchants and all that sort of thing so anybody committing a violation against the samurai was most likely going to get severely admonished or taken away to be punished very 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 severely if it was an attack it was usually an execution so I was very fortunate when I was in Japan to visit a feudal Japanese um, film set where they were they were shooting traditional Japanese films in, and they have a prison, which is wood and big wooden bars. It's very efficient. I actually think I might have actually put it in the video that I shot, and I'm fairly certain I released that video. Now I can't remember, but anyway, um, of of the Japanese prison, it wasn't metal bars. It wasn't metal. It was it was just a prison. And and I think that a lot of times they would be sent there, depending on how on how dramatic it is. Um, the other thing that's very important 
when playing with something like the Japanese feudal system, where there was such a, a strong, strong sense of honor and doing the right code, that should be in your session zero. You should say to your players, okay, we're playing in feudal Japan. That means if you put your hand on your sword hilt and you are looking at a fellow samurai, at another samurai, you are now stepping into combat. And that combat is to the death. And if you are wrong, you have brought dishonor to yourself and to your family and to everyone associated with your family. And now there is major, major problems. Um, so I would create a cheat sheet in terms of honorable acts and dishonorable acts and the appropriate way to behave to, to do that. Uh, get, but get buy-in, okay? Get buy-in. Definitely, definitely get buy-in. Scorch Claw says, can't stick around too long, but thanks for everything that you do. My campaign hit a brick wall and I wasn't happy with it. I've just finished rewriting the whole thing using the five-step adventure guide and very pleased with that. Fantastic. I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you, uh, Scorch Claw, for sharing. Um, Bright Light X, and then we're going to go into reviewing uh, the five-step uh, submissions from you guys. Uh, Bright Light X says, it would be weird for a campaign, would it be weird for a campaign where the whole world and the PCs are evil uh, to make the players fill in a small survey on what are okay and what are not okay topics to explore. So I have a reference for the whole campaign so that I don't forget things after session zero. Absolutely. And there are many, 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 many options there. There really, really, really are. Um, there are templates that you can download. And, um, oh, the name's just gone out of my head. Uh, he's sometimes in the chat. He shared with me a social contract um, questionnaire where it asks, are you happy with, uh, do you have any phobias? Um, do you have any prejudices? Or are there prejudices that you don't want to explore? So you don't have to ask someone, are you a racist? Uh, it would be more along the lines of, are you... Um, uh, do you mind if racial topics come up so we can explore those things? And it's a very difficult space. It is a really difficult space. I mean, I remember when I released my video years ago on racism in role playing and why we shouldn't have racism in our fantasy games. There were so many people, so, so many people who were they were saying we have to have racism in role playing games. It's it's just part of the role playing game. Right. So you never know. You never know what your table is like until you ask those questions and to have it as a questionnaire that could be filled in anonymously. So you just give them the five, each of them a, a copy. They don't write any names on it. They just tick and cross and send through. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant. So, yes, definitely do that. Um I'm seeing here second Thanos's question. What was Thanos's question? Ask it again, please. I missed it. Um, Michael Rock says, I'm running 5th edition and want to put in a magic item with some hidden abilities. Is there a way to keep those abilities secret from spells like Identify without my players feeling cheated? Yes, there is, as far as I am concerned. And the way that you do it is I cast Identify on the spell, on the, on the item. You detect that the item has a powerful transmutation magic upon it and that over time it will evolve certain powers depending on how you use it. That is the magical property. So Identify will tell you, yes, it's going to evolve different powers. What are those powers? We don't know. It depends entirely on how you use it. That's the quiet lie you give to the players if you already know what those powers are if you if they're part of your campaign um but that's okay you've still satisfied the requirements of identify and you've now given your players a mystery where they go oh how i use it do i now do i have to use it backwards maybe i have to use it blindfolded maybe i have to wear a bucket on my head whilst you you know so they can go back and, and, and do that sort of thing but that's definitely what i would do Mm -hmm. uh, Walton S. Lima, and these are the last two questions that I will take before we go to look at the review. So, so hold your questions for next week if you have more. Uh, Walton S. Lima says, how can I use the three clue method in the adventure template? Uh, you, uh, there are multiple adventure templates. There was the one-to-one -one template, and then there's the five-step template. Either way, it doesn't matter. The three clue method or the five clues, I'm erring on five clues these days, but that would be in 
your journey to plot. That would be in your journey to plot phase. Uh, and the introduction to plot is where you would put your, your five clues. As a matter of fact, I'd put five clues in the introduction to plot and five clues into the journey to plot so that when they eventually arrive, they realize that that's not the plot. So in the first section, the clues all point to the murder being committed by the little old lady who writes novels for a living. And the second, the journey there, all the clues point to the fact that there was a typewriter that was used uh, to kill the person. And of course, when they arrive at the plot, the little old lady is standing there with a typewriter covered in blood. It's definitely her. It's definitely her until we discover that she's not physically strong enough to actually lift up a typewriter and so couldn't possibly have been the murderer. Um, and that, you know, so now we, we go off in a different direction. So definitely, definitely something to, to bear in mind um but those are usually where the clues go and then uh, the second half of the adventure shouldn't be clue solving if the first half was clue solving and if the first half wasn't clue solving then the second half if it's clue solving it's going to really slow down so just watch that from a pacing perspective be careful with that uh it could be done it could be done a couple of chase sequences are your openings uh, a combat or three and then they discover that there's actually been a murder that's gone on uh, yeah i could see it working like that but yeah um thanos says did you fix the goblins as i have no idea how to access them having redeemed by first on wednesday Um, going blank on that. Oh, the in Twitch, the goblins in Twitch. No, you collect those goblins. We are nearly at the end of the month. Another goblin will be coming out next month. So you collect those goblins, and eventually there might be something that you can figure out from the goblins that have been released. You tell me. We'll get there. So uh, that's all you need to worry about. Uh, right, so Serpent's Embrace, last question, last question, and then I, I'm already going to do it. I'm going to open up the thing so I don't forget the thing because I'm going to forget the thing and then I'm not going to do the thing and I'm going to get shouted at for not doing the thing. Where the hell did I put them now? Submissions. Okay, cool. I have them ready. <clears throat> Serpent's Embrace 2 says, You briefly mentioned the topic of the PC putting in 100% effort on a particularly important role. Can you elaborate on how you would prefer Dash Dang? <laughs> um, so Serpent's Embrace, what I mean by that is that 4th um, edition D&D was a good example. You had your daily power, which was supposed to be this epic power that you could use only once a day, and it was meant to be super powerful and, and make your character epic. I don't think that when I was playing and when I had players playing 4th edition, those daily powers frequently, frequently, the player would miss, the power was spent, and that was it. It was done. In most role-playing games today, let's say, um, well, let's take, for example, Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. You as the player, you really need to make that persuasion check on the guard to get into the dungeon you really 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 need to do that but your persuasion is a fixed value so what can you do to improve your chances well you can try and persuade the gm that you should have advantage on that role you could maybe try to drug the guard or to get the guard drunk before you try and make them that that but ultimately they will still as a player, you're still only going to get advantage plus your score. The GM might lower the, D the DC in the background, but you don't know that as a player. So your efforts are not, I think, equitably rewarded. So when I was writing the try system and the try fire system, I was going, I want the player to be able to say, I put my heart and soul into this. I prepare. I spend sleepless nights going over this stuff. And I'm going to burn myself to show the amount of effort that's going into it to give myself plus 20 to the roll. So that it doesn't matter what I roll, I will succeed. So it's that kind of, of system that I talk about when I say that the player gets rewarded for really, really putting their all in. And I, this is something that I think comes from my film experience more than anything else. In films, we often see the hero gets beaten down, beaten down, beaten down, beaten down, and as they're about to lose, they draw on that inner strength. 
most role-playing systems don't have that. There is no final, this is it, it's all or nothing. It's just the same or death. And I think that's very, very, very undramatic, personally. That's that's my opinion. So there we are. All right. So now, so now we dive into the submissions. Now, if you don't know what these submissions are about, this is the list here of submissions that were given to me um, during the Circle of World Builders Masterclass. Now, you can jump on to the... Um, how to be a great GM YouTube channel and find the playlist. We put it together of all of the masterclass pieces. So you can go and find those and give those a watch. But these were the entries using the five step method. So I'm just working through these one or two uh, per session and we are opening them up and we're looking at them for inspiration on what to do or what not to do. So I don't know who these people are. They are literally, as you can see, they're just a number to me. So I am just reading them out. No favoritism whatsoever. Let's make that a little bit bigger for you guys to be able to see the text because there's lots of text. Um, lots and lots of text here. Uh, the PCs. Okay, so it's called A Tale of Once, One Cities. Interesting. I think it's a play on a tale of two cities, but this is a tale of once one cities. I, I, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, do we have any? We've got some NPC names. We have some NPCs names. Nam Nori, Lloyd Drez, Durvin and Sheel, Shale, Shiley, Sheely. Um, okay, so there we go. The what has been seated during this adventure? Well, it hasn't been played yet, but I do see that there are some some options there for us. Let's go into it. Let's jump straight into it, and here we go. The PC ship docks in the harbor of West Nowtown, uh, which would probably be contracted into West Nowton, and um, West Nowton. Okay, so the area seems wet and gloomy, and there are no bridges across the river to connect them to East Nowton. Whenever someone around them swears, they turn eastwards and spit. Uh, on their way through the town, the PCs pass two pretty well-dressed women whispering in hushed voices about some conspiracy. Okay, so it's a standard, let's go and, and meet the locals type of thing. You can get this template from my website. That is www.greatgamemaster.com. Look under the Great Library and you will find a section there called Circle of World Builders, um, and it will be in there for you. It's a little bit buried, but you will find it. It's a, it's a PDF called the Five Step Form. So look for that. All right, so, okay, so we've got this, this scenario. We've got some ladies whispering in hushed tones. It's a miserable space. West and East Nowton obviously don't like each other. Okay, that's interestingly set up. What's the conflict for this? One of the women is attacked and killed by Jacker Faces, a mid-sized human in ragged armor, wearing a cloak with hood. The other woman shrieks and runs off in one direction after bumping into one of the PCs and dropping an ornate bracelet. Jack suddenly splits into several bodies, each running off in a different direction and vanishing after the next corner. Okay, that's an interesting one. That's an exciting one. There's Thanos sharing that link about where to find it. Thank you, Thanos. Um, that's for the five steps. That's for this template. Okay, I am intrigued. I don't know about the rest of you. So this is a take on, obviously, Jack the Ripper. But it's Jack of Faces. Why of Faces? Because he has many faces. He has many people. I like that. Hello, unimportant hero. Um, how are you doing? Anyway, so the guards arrive, start questioning the PCs what happened, and soon know it was Jack of Faces, a serial killer supposedly from East Town, uh, who was cursed with a split corporality. Not several personalities in one body, but the other way around, several bodies in one personality. They offer the PCs a reward for catching the murderer. Okay, so if we look at this journey to plot this is in the wrong place this is actually a at plot this is the plot please go find jack of faces right so that's something to bear in mind okay 
that is something to bear in mind, is this should be one up. However, the conflict is, when the PCs start investigating, they come across some street thugs who have seen them picking up the bracelet. After being defeated or befriended, they, or a nearby urchin, drop the name of Vowen Sidebaker, one of the western town's best jewellers. He might know more about her. Who is this lady? I'm not convinced that the PCs are going to care about the bracelet. I feel like we needed a little line somewhere where Jack of Faces kills the one woman. As the other one runs off, he shouts after her, You're next! So that it inspires the PCs to then want to go to finding this woman and to tracking down the bracelet. The street thugs, again, I'm not convinced. Are they picking up the bracelet? It, that's how it's written here. I think the PCs would have picked it up if they had seen this happening to be perfectly honest with you. Um, so so there is definitely that. There is definitely that. But okay, let's let's keep going. Because um, now we're discovering it's not the plot. Vowen can identify the bracelet. He sold it to Nancy Drew. Um, if you don't know who Nancy Drew is, uh, detective series for young readers. Um, uh, aid of the Lord Mayor of West Noughton. He can point the way to the city hall and he can give the PCs her address. The PCs find her in either of those places. She may begin how she may begin how tragic the death of her friend Ruth is, and she might start telling about a conspiracy until the guards burst in to arrest Nancy for obscuring investigation and conspiring with the enemy. They might even accuse the PCs of being involved to the point where they attack. I like that twist. Discover it's not the plot. It's exactly right. So this was a little bit, a little bit, um, we could have done this earlier, but otherwise this is a great twist. I didn't see it. I didn't see it coming. Um, okay. So, so what is it? What is this uh, new, new thing? Either after the guards defeat or in the cells, Nancy tells about the enmity between West and East <coughs> Newton. Since the collapse of the bridges and now and how the mayors nourish this enmity. After all, double the cities means double the office jobs and they kill everyone who might tell about it. At that moment, they're on a small island offshore to plot their further course. I think I've got lost. Who's on their way to an island? the mayors to plot their further shenanigans i think i think that's where it's going uh i think that's where it's going okay what i don't see here though is why or what the pcs could do about it right so sometimes we give out what we think is a plot hook oh the mayors are and what do we want what do you want us to do about it should we build a bridge shall we expose the evil mayors and say that they're i mean uh, if the mayors were both secretly necromancers or had a necromancer in hire who was raising undead or uh i see jack of faces is mentioned later on maybe he's in their employ somehow let's see where we go on their way to the island in the heavy fog they are attacked by jack of faces who can split himself into five different bodies which at will can use their action for blinking around, blah, 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 rules, rules, rules. They all ship, blah, blah, blah. He may be defeated, but before dying, at least one of his shapes will make a run. Okay. All right. I'm hoping that Jack is linked into this somehow. On the island, and again, we're not sure why the pieces are going to this island, the two mayors can be confronted in an old lighthouse, and of course there will be a villain's monologue, times two. The PCs get to choose, join in the conspiracy, and get lucrative offices, or die. Huh. The mayor tells the guards to attack whilst retreating upstairs. I think those guards will be dead by the time the PCs get there. Mm. At the top, uh, they will then attempt a last stand where one of them reveals himself as a war hero, the other as a powerful wizard. At the end, in the lighthouses, the PCs can find several incriminating letters on the mayors, with Nancy's help, they can reveal the doings of the mayors, and first steps towards reunification can be set up uh, until another corpse is found. So, okay. Great start, muddy, muddy conclusion. 
Jack of Faces is attacking. Okay. And they want it to be a red herring. Sure. Using Jack of Faces in the beginning, in the very first part of this adventure, makes sense. It is a red herring, and the players will assume that they have to try and find Jack of Faces. If the bracelet, which I think we should make glowing with a magical energy, and um, wants to get back to its owner, perhaps, because remember, we want to pull the party to try and investigate where is or who is Nancy Drew, the owner of the bracelet. Then they find Nancy Drew, and she, I would say, the way I would change this is I would say that she has the incriminating evidence that the two mayors are colluding and keeping the town separate for their own personal financial gain. The evidence is in her old mansion, which is in an old tower in an island, and that if they will just come with her, then she can get them, and then they can expose it by... Uh, there's a, a gigantic... Um, supposedly peace ball that is taking place that the two mayors are hosting which she has evidence there is going to be um uh violence to prove that the towns can't ever come together if she can get there with the evidence before the violence happens she can expose that it's the two mayors who are causing this to happen to keep themselves financially involved so that's where we get this full 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 disclosure right of this happening then they get arrested and then they get taken to the island because the mayors are there because they know that she has the evidence but they don't know where it is on the island so they have to find it so what that then does is is it sets up the possibility for lots of conflict for the pcs to escape to get the evidence the mayors won't hang around the mayors will go back and host their dinner so that they can stage this dramatic explosion which kills a lot of the dignitaries to keep the fuel fires going of the war between the two of them. The mayors leave, so that's when the PCs can escape from their prison guards, who are obviously inept, go through some combats, all that kind of stuff, then race to get to the ball before the event occurs so that they can then expose the mayors for their villainy. The mayors then reveal themselves as this war hero and as this wizard, and there's a great big showdown, and at the end of it, the town lords everybody as being heroes. And then another body is found to remind us that, oh yes, there was this jack of faces idiot who started this whole adventure off. Now we need to go and solve his problem. Rather than bringing him back, remember the goal is not to repeat yourself, and that is exactly what this is. It's a repeat. And as a result, it makes jack of faces suddenly a very important character in, in, in something that he has nothing to do with. So when it's just one mention and he's being used to instigate a plot, that's genius. That's brilliant because the players now know who he is. There's a little bit of a connection to him. So the next time he strikes in another adventure, they go, oh, but that was a, that, he killed Nancy's friend. Remember? And that got us to the mayor thing. And the da, 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 da. OK, great. So don't use anything more than once. That's that's really the way to, to, to judge Otherwise, I would say this is a pretty good one, except for the ending where it kind of got muddy and that sort of thing. Try and, I, I know we're, we're trying to be clever and we're trying to, to get our players to not see the things coming. Arresting her is the part we didn't see coming. Once she's arrested, it should then be a linear solution. So we've got a little adventure at the beginning and another adventure at the end, if you like. Two straight lines, but the lines go... <coughs> all right? And you can't see that because I'm, I'm, I'm small. That's my take on it. There's 98 of you watching, listening, zoned out, falling asleep, eating ice cream. Oh, ice cream. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of you watching. Do you agree? Do you think I'm completely out of my tree? Should I do another one? Um, has the chat broken? Not falling asleep, says Desmana, just, just snoozing. I'm thinking with my eyes shut was another one that I heard. Uh, another one, another one, another one. Okay, all right, well there we go ice cream yeah ice cream i wonder if ice cream contains caffeine i don't know anyway uh, okay this one is called anna 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 okay anna right 
Uh, yes, we've got time to do another one. Uh, Anna, and we've got some random names. Anna Lucia, Brandleburr. I like that name, Brandleburr. Grummer and Kalathia. Kalathia, or Kale for short. Kalathia, it's a nice name. I like that. Um, well, let's see. The comment is, I hope this is Japanese since Anna means whole. That's interesting. I did not know that. There we go. Anna. Anna. Yeah, Anna. In which case, then it is pronounced Anna. Um, okay, so fellow traveller invites PCs to come to a wonderful annual festival. How nice! She is quite serious and is undisturbed by the fact that the annual festival turns out to be quite bloody. Her parent is a high priest. <laughs> Come with me, my friends. It'll be a great festival. I was told that I had to bring along four sacrifices and you guys will be perfect. Oh, that's lovely. Okay, well, there's already a, a what? When we were talking about subverting tropes. There we go. I like that. Okay. Um, right. Thugs try to capture the PCs for the cigarette sacrifices. Well, that was, that was, we saw that one coming. That's great. Really to be killed by the thugs plus bodies sent at the top of the cigarette for zombie making ceremony. It just gets better and better. I want to make my whole family. Literally. I'm going to make a family. Um, nice. Okay. Great. So, um, the thugs try to capture the PCs. We assume that the thugs will fail. Citizens are unhappy about sacrifices op offered at the top of the ziggurat temple. I would far rather they were offered at sort of mid-level of the temple. So you can get to see what's going on. You know, when they're at the top, I'm just, I can't see what's going on. I'm just not happy. I'm not happy at all. Um, wants the PCs to help and retrieve victims en route. Yeah, if you can get them between halfway and up, intercept them and just bring them back down to halfway and just do that sacrifice at the halfway mark. That'd be brilliant. That'd be brillos. Thanks. Just do that. I'm being facetious, of course, but this is lovely. This is a lovely adventure so far. Um, right. So the PCs have said, right, please go and do this, go and do that. That's brilliant. Uh, free captured citizens from guards, battle composite bird swarm creature guarding exit from bridge to temple. It's brilliant. Okay, good. In order to get to the temple, you've got to cross the bridge. There's a giant bird thing. That's awesome. That's really, really awesome. So far, this is this is perfectly on track. Now, what is not the plot? On the island, the sacrifice of innocence is introverted. At the top of the ziggurat, talking crystal skull, really a damaged my tech med bot, bot artifact, is reanimating bodies into zombies for an army against demon lawn demon land invaders who are trying to establish a democratic government in place... Oh, no, no, sorry. A democratic government, I assume. Unless they're trying to establish... Oh my God, they're trying to establish democracy. This is impossible. We need our theocracy to remain. Um, okay, this is lovely. Right, so hang on a moment. Um, get the top and subvert or destroy Talking Crystal Skull, which doesn't realise what its work is really doing, and find a way out... Fight way out when priests get angry at Zombie Maker not working anymore. Um, okay, now hang on a moment. Hang on a moment. Hang on a moment. Hang on a moment. We haven't inverted it yet. It's They're still being killed, and then the bodies are being reanimated into zombies. That would be my only thing. So if they were being taken to the top of the ziggurat, and then... Um, turn from old people into young healthy people but the way that that's done is the old person's skin is is ripped off and replaced with a new person's skin so it looks like that i mean so so i don't see the inversion happening yet yes there's a, a mech, mech bot that's causing the bodies to animate um and we learn about these demon invaders i think it is meant to be a democratic government uh, which would be an anarchy uh, or anarchic government, um, but but yes, I think that's that's uh, however it works. I mean, uh, the fact that they're trying to establish a democracy is brilliant as well. And also, this might not be English; might not be this person's first language. So I completely, completely retract um, any criticism that we have over this. It is just it is just linguistically amusing. 
uh, not the skill of the person. So if this person couldn't write, if the person doesn't have English as their first language, this is brilliant anyway. It's ready. We've had a strong start. So, okay. So we've got these demons invading and the 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 crystal skull. The priests are still fighting. And the zombie maker not making or not working anymore. I didn't see the twist yet. This is the problem here. This is the problem here. But let's keep going. The demon land pro democracy group are not good people. The elite are engaged in chronic war with Goblin Land as a form of high art. Common people utterly trampled by this because they are cannon fodder. Okay, all right. S but why are the PCs going there? We haven't got a motivation. The PCs destroy the skull. Problem solved, folks. Now you can sacrifice on any level. You don't have to go all the way to the top. Or there are no more sacrifices because the thing is done and there are no more zombies coming out of it. Well done. So I don't see why they would then go to the to the demon territories. We're missing that link. So this is where this is where we've lost we've lost the plot in terms of of, of how it would work. I think. Um I like this. This is great. I love it. Um and this has been done before where the the the, the ruling party use others as 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 art. Um you know, I could even see this as um the 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 captives are made to stand in front of a, a wall that's been painted white and there are various weapons of range and bodily destruction lined up in front of them and the leader gets to fire and how they get splattered against the canvas those canvases get hung up in the castles it's truly horrific but it really is an impression and the last impression that that goblin ever made so there is a form of art there i'm sure of it naval battle pc's battle for control of semi-sentient ship or fight their way past patrols into the city okay it's nice i they, they battle a semi-sentient ship that's cool that's great but i still don't see where they're going where is the plot trusted npc gives pc's important peace message for leaders that is a decapitation weapon. Yeah, that's pretty good at establishing peace. It certainly makes it very quiet. Meant to kill all high-ranking generals, leaders at a banquet. This would kill the PCs too. PCs assassinate, overthrow, or otherwise incapacitate leaders of Demon Land and Goblin Land and either take power or give it to citizens, leaders protected by mechanized tigers. Okay, I... I yeah, sure... Leaders protected by mechanized tigers. That's cool. The PCs becoming the leaders of Demon Land and Goblin Land. Okay, if they if that's the rights, if that's how how succession works, that the 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 leaders once defeated are replaced. That's absolutely fine. Um, that could certainly certainly work. I just have a problem with the link. Why do the PCs go to Demon Land? Are they, are they all communists and they're trying to stop democracy? No, I'm being terrible now. I mean, it's a genuine question. Why would they go to demon land? Why would they, why would they journey in that direction? Um, so, so this is where it kind of, of, of falls apart a little bit for me is, is this. Now, the trusted NPC giving them a peace message. There's this banquet that's going to happen that gets them to go to the banquet and then fight. But that doesn't tell us how they're going to stop this weapon. <clears throat> um so yeah there's a disconnect there how we would fix this i would say is that the innocents who go to the top of the ziggurat they are sacrificed to keep the demon land from invading the sacrifice is done over white canvas and the canvases are sent to the demon land uh as as payment for the demons not invading them all right but the high priest who has to do it is nearly insane because if he doesn't do it, the demon land invaders will come and wipe out everything. Maybe that was the intent of this, but I'm not sure. The medbot thing I don't care about. That that's unimportant here or there. Um, take away the zombie army. It doesn't. We don't need it. If if the whole thing is that they're making artwork uh, for the 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 um, demon people. The high priest who's nearly nuts, he, if he says, I cannot do this anymore, we have th slaughtered thousands, surely slaughtering thousands is, is 
worse than trying to stop this. Please, please, please. The demons have got a very strong sense of ascension. Go kill the ascension um, and, and you know, go, go and become the leaders of this country. That's a tall order to ask the PCs. I don't know how you would sell this. I think the best way would to be to, to, to um, show the demon land that they could invade, but they will be repulsed by the PCs, who are their protectors, perhaps. Um, and if the PCs can just get the gemstone that the demon lord uses to power their army or something then they won't attack because they'll be too afraid that it could be destroyed so if they get leverage over them so then it becomes a collection mission so then the pcs have to break in they fight this semi-sentient ship and they learn about more of this this stuff um and then they, they, this trusted npc we don't need that we don't need that anymore we don't need the banquet anymore um, they break in and they they get this object and they return safely, having defeated the leaders who have mechanized tigers. And you can use all the cool stuff. Uh, that that's that's probably what I would do to try and neaten it up. Um, but yeah, overall, I mean, this first part was really exciting. It was really really fun. Um, yeah, um, I mean, then you get all the impression jokes. Hey, come with me to this amazing annual festival. I'm sure you'll leave a great impression. Uh, it'll really leave its mark. You'll really leave its mark. Uh, yeah, anyway. Okay, so you can see I'm getting tired. Uh, right, so, I, yeah. Again, Anna, it obviously, maybe it meant whole. Um, but I'm not sure how that would, would link into it. So, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's leave it at that. Let's leave it at that. Again, I thank anybody and everybody who submitted. If you do want to submit new ones, become a patron of the YouTube channel, and then you can submit them through to me, and I will review them on the show like this and uh, give you feedback. So there we are. Um, thank you all for being a part of today's show. I do appreciate the company, as always. And um, yeah. I, I see. Oh, Laura Burns, I finally submitted mine. Yay, that's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. I look forward to to going through it once we once we get there. To all of you, it is Sunday night. Um, there was a question about Max Apocalypse. I will be doing a one-shot Max Apocalypse, but I'm not the GM. I'm a player. And I am playing a character that I usually reserve as an NPC in my games... But I wanted to play someone, I wanted to build a character, I really wanted to play a character um, who was something different to what I normally play. Now, uh, I, I don't try and play a normal anything anyway. <coughs> Excuse me. But yeah, this one is very different. And the Max Apocalypse game, all I'm saying is that it will be the first, but possibly not the last time, but definitely the first time I will ever be playing a D and well a, a a role playing game with a puppet. That's all I'm going to say. And we did a session zero, just him and I. Oh boy, yeah, yeah. My character, who shouldn't be the leader, the line went okay. From now on, I'm the adult. That was the sentence that was delivered. It was a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely going to be one to watch. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. The Max Apocalypse system is really subtle. I mean, it's a D100. It's really easy. You do your thing. It doesn't get in the way. It's why I liked it so much that I rented and raved over it. Um, Dead Aussie Gamer Michael Kesev and a good friend of mine. Uh, he will be running it. It will be on this channel, and that will be on... I'm not sure when it's airing. I know we're recording it on the 1st of July. I think it's going to air on the 4th of July. I stand to be corrected. You see what happens when I don't run these games, where I'm just... Um, 
I'm just part of it. But uh, it's going to be, one way or another, it's going to be a lot of fun to do. Uh, from me, all that's coming up is this Wednesday is the one-on-one -on -one session with Raj, the Tabaxi merchant, gem merchant, as we continue that game. Um, and then Mercs of Mischief on Thursday morning, as usual, although that is also wrapping up. I think it's episode nine this, this, this Thursday. So there is that. Um, yeah, and I think... I'm going to start releasing the TriFi um, episodes, although they're not going to be continuous. Though that's the only thing. I don't know. I don't know. Is it better to release like four weeks worth of episodes and then possibly end up running out of shows and then having a gap, or to wait until I have enough shows that it would just be a continue, or just wait until I'm done? And then release the I I don't know I don't know I don't know I don't know um, we'll have to see we'll have to see anyway from me thank you for all being part of this I can't wait to to engage with you again on one of the platforms um, I hope you all have a fantastic week and if you are fathers uh, it's Father's Day here. I think it's Father's Day here. Or it's Father's Day in South Africa anyway. So if you're South African or you celebrate Father's Day today, happy Father's Day. And until next time, I wish you and yours all the very happiest of gaming.